My first question is, how do you feel if connecting to love as a state of consciousness can help transform our state of purpose and deeper connection to life and you know, our higher self? start? Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is a very complicated question. And I warned her I'm gonna, I was going to make it simple. For me, the question is where do you find love and where is your model for what love looks like? I think it's a really good question because most of us think love is what we saw when we were kids in the relationships we were in. Not so sure that that was always love. <laughs> Right? They lived happily ever after, but that's always the beginning of the story, not the end. So you never know what happened after they supposedly lived happily ever after. So for me, I've been looking for what, wh where is this unconditional love? Because I like the idea of, of love being unconditional. Well, there's, one there's only one place where it is. It's called life. Why is that unconditional love? Because the energy that keeps me alive has been taking perfect care of my body through all my dramas and all my traumas and all of my crazy things. I was born in the Second World War, so we were refugees when I was two, right? And I remember bitching about the war when I was 27, but the war was finished when I was two. And the whole time I was bitching about the war and during the war, something took perfect care of me. It occurred to me one day that maybe I ought to get to know that thing that took perfect care of me. And that requires m me to bring my awareness inside, so it kind of let go of the world outside, let go of my beliefs, let go of my body, and bring my awareness into the energy of life. I can see it, I can hear it, I can feel it, and I can taste it. And in that place, I feel so taken care of that I don't need to steal your shit. And when I don't steal your shit, we can live in harmony. <laughs> and when I feel taken care of, there is nothing left to do but to give. Until I feel taken care of, everything I do is going, going to have an element of what can I get for myself out of that. Even though, by nature, every one of us was born whole with everything we need already built in. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> are we, are we, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you can't disagree or agree. You have to see it yourself. <laughs> so I'm, I'm all about living in the flow and just going with it, and that was really powerful. And I think, you know, to take it from there, for us to recognize that we are reflecting each other. And the more we're able to go within and really break through the layers and you know connect with ourselves, connect with our authenticity, and really understand what love means, then can we go in the world and reflect that magic. And doing that, that's medicine. So I think if we step into each day setting a powerful intention in how you want to show up in the world, and keeping in mind that we're here to make this the best possible experience for each other. So how are we intentionally curating spaces, whether it's just us going to get tea, whether it's us doing yoga, whatever it is, how are we intentionally curating spaces for each other to step into and thrive? And for me, intention is, is a really huge part of really uh, taking love and expanding it on a much deeper level than what we experience it now. And that's all I have to say. All right, I, I really like where this train is headed. So <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump right on. Um, I really like actionable things. So I, I could not agree more with, with what's being said. And, and when I think about like the big picture of how, how do we fix the world, that can be, I mean, that can be paralyzing because any one person, you just go, that is so much. Like, how, how can I be a part of that? I want to be a part of that, but where do I start? And something I've thought about a lot lately as a person um, is just examining, examining the relationships I have in my life and the communities I have in my life. And you, you can really look at them in really stark terms of, 
is this a community of negative attraction or is this a community of positive attraction? Because I think that what we're really experiencing, certainly in the United States and, and probably everywhere in the world right now, is, is those two things really, really butting heads of we're being told by the media, we're being told by, by so many powers out there that are, that are bigger than any of us um, that, we should be, that we should be honoring these negative attractions, that we should be focusing on us versus them. What, what pits me against other people? And we all do that. I mean, we're certainly all very susceptible as human beings to sort of honoring our lizard brain impulse to go, what do I not like? You know, what, what, you know let, I'm attracted to other people who don't like the things that I don't like, you know? <laughs> And I think that just a really easy step you can take and put into practice in your own life is just look across the board, look at the relationships you have and, and, and see like, is this something where I am bound to this other person because we don't like the same thing? And maybe examine that and see if you can transform that into a relationship where you do like the same thing. And if you can't transform it, maybe that's a relationship you allow to pass out of your life. Um, and I think that that's just a really easy way to get started, and, and that will echo out throughout these webs that we weave. Yeah, I think that's a huge point, particularly when it comes to our lives today with how important social media is <laughs> to, to all of us. And it is, you can, you can decide what you're looking at and what information you're taking in and, and how, it, how it dictates you. I was talking to somebody the other day and there's this book that I'm reading called Awareness by Anthony DeMello. I don't know if anyone's read it here, but it's absolutely incredible. And he talks about how we can be around people in relationships and they can push a button and, you're, and you go up. They can push a button and you go down. So we give so many people an incredible amount of power over our own sovereignty of emotions. And I think it's just getting, getting really clear about who you are, removing those layers, getting super authentic, living in your truth, because truth is love, and expressing that way. And that's how I think we start to you know, bring more love and light and fun into this world. Because I mean, look, we're all here to have fun, right? At the end of the day, let's do this. Let's do this. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so kind of taking, um, uh, piggybacking off of what you just said here about challenges, right? Dealing with negative situations and how do we transmute that through love. I think one of the greatest challenges to remain in this space of love sometimes can be when we're in business or career because we are in this paradigm of competition and you know I believe collaboration is really the way of the future but the us versus them mentality puts us in this feedback loop of negative 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 so in business and career how do you remember to remain in a place of love especially when you're hit with adversity and challenging personalities and people that make you maybe not want to feel so in love all the time so Okay, um, okay, cool. Let me see, what did you just say? Okay, yes. No, that, that's a good question because I, you know, being an artist, being a businesswoman, you know, have, having my own business and also, um, you know, working in the cannabis industry, for me, uh, what, I, what I'm realizing is when it comes to us doing business with integrity, I think it's really about us showing up and setting the, setting the standards so that whoever you're dealing with is already attuned to um, the level at which you wanna operate. I feel like it's really up to us to lead by example and bring these elevated frequencies into these spaces because they don't exist, because traditionally it's more of a competition and it's like step on people to get to the top and different things like that. But what I'm seeing is as consciousness, is, it has become this trend and the paradigm is shifting, more and more people are um, operating from a business level 
from their heart and it's really beautiful but I think it's a matter of us showing up and there's been many times where I've had you know some struggles and you know having to you know be respected and feel respected as an artist but also as a business woman as a woman of color being in these spaces and having these conversations really uh, gave me the opportunity to speak my truths and speak up for myself and really show up in those moments because ultimately we are the renaissance. Everybody in here, we're creating a new paradigm. We're creating a new society. So really we are the leaders. We are at the forefront. So what's starting to happen is a lot of corporations and things like that are wanting to infiltrate into the creativity, into the healing world and things like that. So it's up to us to show up, set the standards, and you know, operate with integrity through business and lead by example. Is that cool? Um, I, I think Lizzie brought up a really important word, which is respect. And I'm sure everyone here knows that feeling of working with people where there is a lack of respect. Um, be it be it someone you're you're in business with, or working for, or working collaborating with. And um, it, is, it is probably the most fundamental challenge you can face, is, is that feeling of not being respected. Um, but I think it's also important when that happens, it's an interesting exercise to put yourself in that person's shoes and go, why do they not respect me? And nine times out of 10, you'll find it's, not, it's, not pers it's never personal. But nine times out of 10, it's, it's like really not personal. It's their own thing. Like, that, that you remind them of someone or that you embody something that they just, for whatever reason, cannot bring themselves to show you that modicum of respect. And the, and the bottom line is, good work does not get created when there's a lack of respect. Um, and obviously these things can be very challenging and they occur along a spectrum of disrespect. And sometimes the minor disrespect over a long period of time can be way worse and harder to manage than like a massive disrespect. Um, I have found, again, an actionable way of, of handling that. If, if you find yourself in that situation and someone is like coming for you, and I don't know, maybe this is just my own background and my perspective, is if someone is not going to be their higher self, then I'm just not going to, I think the best way to honor them is to not honor that behavior, is especially with the internet, if you make work for the internet, you know, I'm a human woman with a corporeal form. Like, I know what it is to have people like come for me on the internet. And I think that the, I have found the best way for me to still feel good about moving forward with my work, with my life, is to go, this person has some reason why they have to put that hateful thing out there. That's coming from pain. I think the best way I can respect them is to let, let them say what they need to say, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna argue with them. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna honor dishonorable behavior and, and I'm gonna allow them to sit with that because they're working through something. And I think that that's perhaps the most loving way you can be to someone who's disrespecting you is to just go, I'm not going to al allow you to abuse me because that's not good for me and it's not good for you. So I, I choose to just let, let you be with that. Um, someone that inspires me all the time is my fiance, Aubrey Marcus, who um, owns On It, CEO of On It. And his mindset behind how he runs his company is amazing because his number one thing is full transparency. And it's full transparency within the company, but then it's also full transparency with all of his customers. So they had some sort of breach that happened and they had the idea, they had the, they could either come to their customers and say, hey, this is what happened or we can sweep this under the rug and they don't really need to know. Um, but that didn't sit well with him. And so he said, no, 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 we have to let them know what's going on. And it was like a credit card breach and um, it, was, it was big. And so he came out to all of his customers letting them know that this is something that happened but because it was done in such a way of full transparency, people were super supportive about it. And I think 
it's that's something that I try to bring into my own business and my own company, just realizing like, okay, I'm gonna live here in my truth and be yeah. as transparent as I possibly can yeah. be with the people that I work with and with my customers, not only with you know what's happening right. behind the scenes, but also what's happening with me personally. You know, I, me and Aubrey both, we put a lot of our life out there for people to see and witness and, and our life is something that seems to either fascinate or trigger the hell out of people um and that's fine but it's it's like okay we're here we're being transparent we're being honest knowing that this can benefit and help and people can stand on our shoulders so we'll take a few arrows for you guys what was the question <laughs> No, I know what the question was. So if, if it's true that each of us in the core of our being, in the energy that keeps us alive, is love, and we are present to that, then the next step is how do you stay in that presence, in that self-presence, when your senses always take you out into everything that's going on outside? And we're geared by nature for that because whenever something changes, we have to assess it because it's about survival. Is this, is this friend or foe? So we're naturally geared for our senses to take us out away from ourselves. Except I realized at one point, because I was always going in, having a wonderful experience, going out and having the same shit as before. And one day I said, fuck it, there must be a way that I can drag this experience out into the world with me, because that's what I really want to do. And the moment that I was clear about the intent, it became a lot easier. But it still takes practice every day, so I will take the practice to connect in and go deeper every day. And every day I will, I will say, and I'll do this before I get out of bed in the morning, right? Because I want to start my day that way. And every morning when I go, is even, even in dressing, you know, it's how quick it is to, to get distracted, right? You put on your pants. You have to put on your pants or your underwear as slow as you need to go so you can maintain your self-presence while you're doing it. And then you can live your life in a way at a pace, and I call it the pace of the heart, a pace that allows you to stay present. And when you can be that present and somebody jams at you, you can stay in that place because you know what somebody else expresses is about them because it's coming out of them. It's their expression of their state. And if they call you an asshole, it might be true that I'm an asshole, right? But it's coming from the asshole in them because it's their expression, right? And so it's not a big deal, right? And literally... Literally, it is possible to stay in that place. And of course, when I can stay in that place in the world, that's when the world gets transformed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you guys are amazing. This is just so inspiring. I'm like, my heart. <laughs> um, one of my favorite quotes ever is by a theosophist named Alice A. Bailey, and she talks about how the universe is this great hall of mirrors. And I think that like loving that reflection and allowing the reflection to reflect back or seeing something in that reflection that's an echo of you, it's just, we can learn so much about ourselves from that space. So um, segueing into the next question, I'd love to know what your thoughts are about love in the romantic sense in these modern times. Like, how do you feel that paradigm is shifting and evolving and taking this high-level consciousness we're bringing to the conversation into romantic love? Whitney, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm still figuring this out. Um, I certainly have no idea. Um, but I think it's... In modern relationships today, everything is up for negotiation. Um, I think we've always come from an idea of relationships are very binary. We're this way or we're this way. We're together or we're not together. We're monogamous, we're not monogamous. It's like, there's so, it's, it's very bi binary. Um, and so I think with modern relationships, everything's up for negotiation. You sit down with your partner, you both come from that love place and see what feels best for you. And it's infinite. There's so many things and there's so many ways that you can have your own relationship regardless of what 
any of you guys do. You know, mine will be different from you and yours will be different from hers. And it, it just goes on like that. And I think if we can get to a place of being fully, okay, what is my truth? What makes me the happiest? What am I the most fulfilled? And how can I create that relationship? Then you can sit there across from somebody and be like, all right, let's meet each other. Let's be allies in this. Let's be teammates in this and support each other. <laughs> Thanks, girl. I love that. I, I'll take the, I'll take the. So look, so I was thinking about that on my drive over and, um, you know, I read this meme the other day and it said something like relationships nowadays are less collaborate on a relationship. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's like collaborating on a project. And uh, for what you said, it's, it's if two people can come together, communicate clearly, um, you know, our truths and, uh, you know, come to an understanding that it's about our constant ability to love ourselves more and to show up for ourselves more th so that we can continue showing up for each other. Um, but you still have the freedom to grow and thrive, but we're here consciously together with the intention to help each other thrive, to maybe start some really dope creative projects, to you know start a new business, to make a baby, whatever it is, um, it's about coming together and setting the intention for, for what works with yourself and knowing that you don't need to fall under any mold, any type of traditional uh, thing that already existed. But like I said, we are the change makers. We are the Renaissance leaders. And right now, a huge part of um, what we're redefining are relationships. So it's really beautiful. Because like you said, everybody can have their own thing. You can have 10 booze if you want, chilling on the pool with your feet up, getting a CBD coconut oil massage. or. <laughs> You can hold it down, you know, with one boo your whole life and change the world together. But it's a beautiful time to be here because we do have the freedom to create that. I, I love that, yeah. I, I mean, the idea of, of a relationship as a collaboration and this idea that we, we are able to, to negotiate the terms of our relationships. I mean, when I think about, like, as a child, Growing up in the Midwest, the sense of like it felt like like lo like romance was like a fixed price menu. Like it's this and then it's this and then it's this and then you die. <laughs> like, and I think that we have found that this awareness has come about. I think in no small way because of the internet. Places like the Midwest that may have been more of like a cultural no man's land, we're getting this degree of awareness that that reached people people like me and others. And through the internet, um, I almost visualize it like the rainforest, you know? Like the rainforest has all these animals that are hyper-specialized. Like you get, like my visual is like the birds of paradise. I don't know if you've, if you've ever watched Planet Earth or our planet, like how all these species of birds of paradise exist and they're hyper-specialized. You know, it's like through the internet, you're able to go, well, look, like I have these shiny rainbow feathers and I do a dance like this. And <laughs> you're able to like put that out there in the world and find this person or people, multiple people who, who are attracted to that. And that's, that's new. It used to be more of like, you better hook, get your hooks in someone before <laughs> you, you know, you age out of it. And it's like, the internet has just created this, this ability to, to open up this idea of it's not a fixed price menu. It's an a la carte, baby. It's a buffet. Get what you, you know, get what you want. Yeah, like get, get what you want and show everyone what you have to offer. Like especially being, being a woman, being a queer person, being whatever, whatever you personally are, you no longer have to try to like fit yourself into this narrow performance of what you think other people will find attractive. Like, I think the internet is, is this tool that has allowed us to enact the gift of choice. Like, we have the gift of choice, which a lot of people find a burden. You know, a lot of people would rather go probably for the fixed price menu because it's easier. But I think for so many of us, you, you see how it's like, that's, that's what we get as this gift of modern love, is that we really can make ourselves available to all these other options that are out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So I'm old enough to be really clear that I don't want to be in a relationship with a woman who does not already feel whole in herself. Because there's two ways we do relationship. If, if, if you're whole and the person you're with is whole, you can have a dance. You can have fun, like you're talking about. If you don't feel whole, there's always going to be the expect, expectation that the other one is going to complete you. But you cannot complete someone else. They're complete to begin with, and they just haven't done their homework. So my advice to my kids is, listen, you guys are not ready for a serious relationship until you have commit, made a commitment to your own life to be present in your own life. Because if you haven't made a commitment to your life, you cannot be counted on to make a commitment to somebody else's life. Do they, do they uh, heed my advice? Nah. <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I, you know, and I didn't do it that way either. You know, I, the way mine started uh, was I met the woman. She was beautiful. I saw the goddess in her. She had never opened her mouth. So I didn't know all the denials of her goddessness that were going to come out. I hadn't opened mine, so she didn't see what all the denials of my godlikeness was going to come out. And I started to see we were going to have some problems. And I said, never mind, I'm in love, we'll deal with it later. And fuck did we deal with it later, <laughs> right? So, so fundamentally, number one job is there's never going to be a man who will complete you. There will never be a woman who will complete you. You were made complete. If you are clear about that, and if you don't feel complete, you know you need to go to yourself to feel complete. Then you can have some amazing relationships, both in everywhere, whether it's romantic or in business or in friendships. But number one job will always be doing your homework. I'd love to piggyback on that quickly, because I completely agree with you, and I love that so much. And things that I do with my clients, it's first and foremost, you have to make a commitment to yourself, if you, regardless of what type of relationship you're in, regardless. But particularly when it comes to unconventional relationships, you have to, first and foremost, have to make a commitment to yourself to look at your shit and look at your shadow. If you're not going to do that, you're just setting yourself up for some suffering. And to look at your beauty, absolutely. And I think, but also being like bringing up your, your shadow and looking at it allows you to really fully embrace your goddessness or your beauty or your light. That's the only way we can see it. <laughs> yeah, it's finding, finding a way to live between that delicate dance of like light and dark, shadow, spirit, density of this planet, like being present through all of it. Um, so we've talked today about love and relationships, love and friendships, love and business, but how do we imbue this into the earth? You know, climate change, all of these ticking, talk, ticking time bombs that are kind of happening with our planet. How do we take that and radiate it towards the home that we're in right now? Well, I want to start this one. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've been, I was in the, uh, I was around when Greenpeace started and we used to, used to go there and I also sprayed pesticides and got poisoned by them. So, so I've been, but when you look at the planet, clearly we're doing some things that are not sustainable. Okay, and it was already obvious in the 60s, it's worse now because nobody's done, really done much about it. The, the point that I've come to is, and again, it's almost like you're gonna get bored with what I'm gonna say, but the point that it com comes to is, we will not take care of an environment, of our environment, until we feel cared for. Gonna be job one for human beings, because it's from not feeling take care of that we fucked it up, right? And everybody knows we got 12 years, or whatever it is that people say, and then, you know, but how do you get anybody on board to do anything? Well, you can't because everybody's tr chasing whatever they're chasing, hoping that they'll get taken care of by it. What's so cool about it is taken care of is not about anything you do and will never be about anything you do. 
When we feel taken care of, we are in a different state, and from that state, we can take care of the environment and each other and ourselves. You know, when I don't feel taken care of, if people feel bad enough about being alive, they don't even take care of their body. And in fact, if they feel really bad about being alive, they kill themselves, right? So there has to be some, some enthusiasm about our own existence that will translate into the things that need to be done to clean up the environment and to stop fucking it up. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think Udo hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it's, the word is interdependency. Like, human beings, we are part of this ecosystem, and that's what we're seeing everywhere, is this, this lack of people valuing themselves, valuing life, valuing others. And um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the actionable step is on that one. It's like you said, it's, it's almost like you can't... You are whole. It's... it's um, I think that we do have to start, though, with, with human beings and with, with awareness, um, because from there, it becomes so clear to you, oh, I am of the earth, I am part of the earth, we are part of the earth, we as, as homo sapiens are our own mass organism that is part of it all, and so we got to clean up our own shit first. I, I really think it's, it, it comes down to that. Yeah, um, so what I'm thinking about is if we look around and recognize how much power is in this room, understanding uh, the magnitude of the vortex that we've created and knowing that anything that we speak in this space amongst all of these powerful creators will expand across the universe. And I think for us, it's about, like I say, showing up. So how are we showing up as leaders in our communities where we are mindful of the things we're wearing and, you know, reusing our, you know, having our own glass jar and uh, setting intentions and giving gratitude to the earth and walking by plants and acknowledging and feeling the wind on your face and like speaking that expression out loud in these little ways that we can show and just be leaders by uh, being more intentional with how we're connecting to the earth. Um, I think it, it will make it more powerful, but it does start, you know, with us every day, just showing up. I have a friend, um, Corinne Loperfito, who she dedicated one year of her life to living zero waste. And she went and lived in a van on the road. And so her whole journey, but I watched her, you know, uh, slowly like switch out, you know, having mason jars when she goes to the bulk section. Uh, if there's strawberries that she wants, but they're only packaged in pla plastic, she won't buy it. She'll figure out another way to get it. But also it's up to us in our local markets and our local restaurants. Ask the restaurants, are you composting? Ask the, you know, the markets, um, can, we not, can we use glass instead of plastic or be more mindful of how we're showing up in our communities, but it definitely starts with us being the change and activating the change in the smallest ways possible. Yeah, as something that I bring into my life a lot is just the saying that you go first. Like, you go first. Like you're saying, be that example, be that leader, right? Okay, so do it. Set that example. You go first and have people see it and, and ask questions about it because even when we're talking, we're not talking about psychedelics, but even when we talk about psychedelics, you come back from the jungle and you all, sometimes, maybe we all know somebody or you've done it yourself or I've done it, we talk about, oh, you got to go to the jungle, this is for you, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you know, and instead of just being, being and showing up who you are, like, okay, just be, do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself, do the things that you need to do to take care of this planet and this wonderful fucking awesome playground that we are so blessed to play in. Like, let's, like I said earlier, let's do this. <laughs> so yeah, it's all, I think it's really just about you going first and setting that example and just being, being that love and being that example for everyone. I think what it boils down to, right, is embodiment on every level. Like, walking the talk, being what you say you are. I love this Zen kind of quote. 
like love, yeah. <laughs> um, it says, teach not talking, which is ironic. We were sitting here having a panel discussion, but you can teach so much through what you embody. And the louder you are, sometimes the less people hear, but the more you silently embody and walk that path, the more change is inspired. So all of your answers have been so inspiring on every level. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I have one more question for everybody, and then we're going to open it up to audience Q&A. Um, so basically, I'd love to wrap it up by asking what love as a superlative human state means to you. Love as a state. Well, everything is a state of being. There's like thousands of states of being. When you embody those states of being, whatever, whatever state of being you embody determines where you're going. Because your whole body is organized sometimes just around a crazy idea or a bad or or a negative emotion, you know. If you're t if you're f if you're afraid, you're gonna see enemies everywhere. If you're angry, you're gonna s you're gonna see things you need to fight. If you're in peace, you find out that peace has always already been everywhere, always inside you, outside you, everywhere, even on the battlefield. Your state of being creates your perception. And, you, and by creating your perception, your state of being creates your world. Out of the peace comes the love. And the love, as a state of being, creates, basically makes everything work. So that, you know, so it works for everybody at nobody else's expense. And that state of being, to embody that state of being, for what we're here on this planet to do, it's the only one that really works. It's the only one that's sustainable, right? And you know what? For like 300,000 years, we've tried every, every other one. We've just never gotten organized. We're really good when, you get, when we get organized, you know? Like the shit that we can do when we cooperate, yeah. how about we cooperate about right. living in the state of being of love and then recreating the world from that state of being instead of all the other shit that we do. Yes, exactly. Living in love. That requires daily practice. That requires um, daily practice of surrender um, to the flow, of surrender to your truths, of surrender to your greatness. Because love is everything. And similar to what he said, if you think about um, existing in the vibration of love and really allowing yourself to fine tune that vibration as if it's when you listen to 88.1, you get jazz. And when you listen to 92.3, you get hip hop. And if you want to exist on the frequency of jazz, you just got to fine tune the vibration to 88.1. So it's like, when you can wake up in the morning and set the intention of always wanting to walk in love before you walk out of the door, you set that intention. Today, I will walk in love. I am walking in love. When you say that, when you set that intention, the universe perfectly aligns in divine order opportunities and experiences for you to show up in that space, for you to be love um, for someone, for you to feel love from someone for you to just exist. And from there, like he said, you know, you can experience abundance and prosperity and opulence and super fun, you know, you know, hanging out on a yacht is 82. You're with all your friends, kicking back, eating fresh pineapples. There's a violin player playing and the sun is just glistening on your skin. You can manifest those experiences when you choose to walk in love. And choosing to walk in love is easy. You just have to practice it every day. Yes. <laughs> Hell yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's it. It's love is a superlative human state because love creates flow. Love creates attraction. When you are in that space of attempting to create, if you allow yourself to be in the state of fear, you have, you know, RuPaul calls it your dark passenger, or, or Jung calls it the shadow self. You have, you have this voice that criticizes, this voice that tells you it's not good enough, and it, again, it, it stops you, it stops up flow, it, it constipates it, it's awful. 
it's to be creating from a place of love allows you to transcend uh, the stinking thinking, you know? It allows you to just truly open yourself up and let something channel through you without judgment. And it allows things like that beautiful day you <laughs> described to emerge in your life. Because if you practice love as a daily ritual, as a daily state of being, it is inevitable that loving things, you're a magnet for them, they come to you. And if you let, if you let the fear take over, you attract fearful, terrifying, scary ass things. So it, it really is, again, the action of making yourself be in that state. And it's not, it's to varying degrees of ease sometimes. But, but flow, I, I find as a creative person, that is, that is, mwah, that's the thing you're looking for, is to have it all flowing through you. Absolutely. <laughs> um, for me, it's, I, I mean, coming from a place of love and acting out of a place of love. And I feel like in our society today, a lot of the times we do things trying to get love instead of just being love. Um, and I am a master in distracting myself from not looking at my stuff. And so I think we all, as we know, we have, we're full of love. We are love. So we do the practices that get us closer to God, the universe, love. I mean, they're all synonymous. But it's like, okay, let's also do the things, or let's not do the things that are going to distract us from not having that. We already have it. And it's already there. But we spend so much time not wanting, to, not really wanting it, and not really wanting to do the things that will get us that love. We act like we really want that love, but do we do the things every day to get there? I don't know. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. You go first. <laughs> thank you, everyone. This is so awesome. I'm just feeling the love on every level, so thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so everybody, if you have any questions, we're going to open up to audience Q&A, so um, if you feel called to ask, now is the time. <laughs> so the question was, how would you recognize love if you've never experienced it? It's, it's impossible to not have experienced love because when you spent your first nine months or however long it was in the Buddha tank, you were actually in love. And, when you, and if you haven't experienced it outside and you've forgotten, when it comes to you, you feel it and it's very familiar. Because it's always been there as part of your nature. Can I, I, can I tell a little story? Yeah. I, was taking a, I was taking a master's degree in counseling psychology from, Alfred, from Adler University. And they have a particular view, and they asked me in the, first, in the first course, how did your parents show love? And I said, they didn't. Because I always grew up, I always felt they didn't love me. Of course, they could have cooked and eaten me, but I wasn't thinking about it that way. So I felt like, you know, and they didn't hug and kiss like people do in North America. So I said, my parents didn't love me. So I said, they didn't. So he waited a second, and he said... Uh, so, would you answer my question? And I said, I thought I did. And he said, no, you didn't answer my question. So I said, okay, ask the question again. Maybe I misheard you. He says, how did your parents show love? <laughs> uh, then I went around, I said, they didn't. And they waited again, and then he asked again, how did your parents show love? He would not allow me to get away with the notion that my parents didn't love me. And I didn't get that when he was doing it. So then I was... And so the third time he asked me, I was like, oh, when my mother loved me, she would, her eyes would sparkle. And when my father was pleased, he would bump me with his shoulder. And he said, thank you. Because <laughs> he wouldn't let me get away with oh, they didn't love you. And I think, in a way, whatever we've been through, there's a story like that in everybody.
So the question was, what morning rituals do you guys do? I'll take that one. So for me, I'm all, I'm all about a nice morning ritual. And personally, I like to keep it sexy too. So, <laughs> so for me, of course, as soon as I open my eyes, I'll repeat a really powerful affirmation. And lately I've been saying, um, I am open to unexpected and infinite abundance. And I say that and I allow myself to feel into what that feels like. Um, I'll do a stretch, a morning stretch, so I can get flexible, so I can stay in the flow. Of course, drinking a lot of water um, in the morning just to stay hydrated, just to keep the energy flowing. And my favorite part of my morning ritual, I have this really beautiful CBD-infused breast massage oil. And for me, I'm all about um, showing myself and honoring and worshiping myself in different ways every day, finding new ways to fall in love with myself. And breast massage has become a part of my daily routine and has definitely elevated my life in many ways. And if you do a mirror massage, especially for women, um, because there's so much um, kind of trauma and just like misunderstanding around the power of our breasts and our womb. So looking in the mirror, and it can be CBD oil, it can be coconut oil, jojoba, avocado, with a dash of lavender, whatever you choose. Um, and you look at yourself and you allow yourself to breathe a few times and, you know, release those beliefs that don't serve you. Because oftentimes when we take a moment to look at ourselves in the mirror, the first uh, few thoughts aren't always of love. So it's about us being able to really fall in love and just face whatever we see. And then, you know, you give your breast a massage and at the same time, you're doing a lymphatic cleanse. And that's something that a lot of women don't, aren't aware of is having that lymphatic system cleanse. Um, but the breast massage, you just, you know, repeat to yourself, I am powerful, I am confident, I am sensual, I am created, creative, my womb is activated. When you allow yourself to start your morning like that, especially if you got like a nice sexy, R&B song playing in the background. <laughs> Maybe you got that new Lizzie Jeff playing. It's called Bedroom Flow. That's a really nice one. Um, <laughs> but you start your day off with that kind of power. I am a queen, I am a king, and today I will step out into the world in the highest, most expressive version of myself. So I know it sounds like it takes a lot of time, but you give yourself a five minute stretch, 10 minute stretch, a five minute breast massage, or just a mirror meditation every day will change your life in drastic ways. So have fun with it, get creative, light a candle, turn the lights low, put a sexy, you know, lace kimono on, maybe throw a little fishnet stocking on. <laughs> No, this is morning. We're still in the morning. Wow. <laughs> Any time of day. Thank you. That sounds incredible. <laughs> yes, please. Um, uh, for me, you know, I this sound is gonna sound it's super simple, but I was not doing it until maybe four or five years ago. That once my wife and I started dating, like breakfast every morning, like really taking time to eat a substantial breakfast. I like to have a goblet of yerba mate, which is like, it. yeah, it takes, it's like you have to take your time with it. It's not as like fast gulp it down as coffee. Like I take my time with it. I, I get that like good plant essence in me. And then, and even though she, you know, leaves for work and I, I work from a studio connected to my home, just having that time whether, whether you do have a significant other or you are just being with yourself at that time, just having breakfast, I mean, my God, like I can be such an asshole if I'm hungry and like not nice to myself. So like that is one of those weird things that it took me, you know, most of my life to get to. Just be like, oh girl, have breakfast. Like you're gonna get a lot better things done. And like a real breakfast. Don't like, you know, not something that's high sugar, something with protein, something, find a way to eat something that's a complete meal in the morning. Um, and then from there, right before I start work, I meditate. I do a 20-minute meditation. 
I picture myself on standing at the precipice. I live in a canyon, so I look out at the other side of the canyon, and I picture myself standing there, and I send just like heart energy out to myself. And then every day around 4 or 5 p.m., I take a walk, a three-mile walk, and I walk up to that spot I look at, and I stand there, and I send that heart energy back to myself looking into my, into my studio window. And ever since I started doing that, like I get messages from myself. I get messages from, I don't know where they're coming from, you know, the collective consciousness. I have found as a writer, as a thinker, as just like a human being who doesn't want to feel anxious and shitty all the time, <laughs> it, has, it has truly transformed my life. So I, you know, I'm saying meditation. This is probably a group where everyone's like, yeah, we know meditation. But like, it really took me a while to get there to like actually be like, no, really, though, just do it, and it does really benefit you. Um, I try not to look at my phone, which uh, is usually my first thought when I wake up, and most of the time I end up looking at my phone. But after that, I like to, I just started doing kirtan, which is like chanting and singing, and for me, I've always had a big fear of singing and I wanted to just open that channel and I feel like for a lot of people using our voice is challenging at times because it's vulnerable and that makes us feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and so for me it's, okay, I guess I won't pick up my phone yet and then I'll do my chanting and then I do light hydration and movement. So I like to get, look, you know, get, get out in the sun if the sun's out um, or juve and um, drink water with lemon and some Himalayan sea salt, and um, then just do a little bit of movement to get kind of things moving around, and then a nice cold shower. So I'm strange about rituals. The way I think of rituals is eating is a ritual, bathroom is a ritual, sleeping is a ritual. So my life is full of normal, natural, rituals that are pretty much common to every human being. What I do in the morning as a ritual is I like, be, when I wake, wake up, I say to, as a joke to people, what do you do in the morning? I say, well, after I wake up, I like to check in to see if I'm still there, because if I'm not there anymore, there's no point getting up, mm -hmm. right? But what I, what I do is literally, I'm lying down because I don't want pressure on my body, have my eyes closed because I don't want to be checking out the world. And doing a, what I call self-knowledge, bringing the awareness inside. Start with here, breathing. And I like that, rich, that is of all of the rituals I do is the most important because this I can carry out into the world with me. I can't be checking out the light inside when I'm driving on the road. Right? So, and I can't be listening to the sound of silence inside when I'm talking to people. But I can always be present here. So I do my, I do that self-knowledge practice. I'll do it sometimes if I have time. I'll do it for two hours. And it used to be when I started, it was like, oh, meditation, oh, it's boring. You know, do you know how unbelievably peaceful that boredom is? Right? So fall in love with that boredom because when you get to the boredom, it means you're out of your addiction to, to change and to, to, to crisis and emergencies and stuff. And you're out of that addiction and you haven't quite got to the bottom of the light in you, the sound in you, the feeling in you. And that in between is, is that boredom. That boredom is the best sign ever that you're, you're heading in the right direction. I like to do that before I get into, out of bed. And what I found is sometimes I'll do a, a practice for an hour. And I'll, I'll, at the end of it, I'll say, well, I never experienced nothing. Right? But I'll notice my, days goes, my day always goes better. Uh -huh. And I like to start my day there, there because that's really who, what, I'm, what I'm on this planet for, is to bring more of that into the world in my sphere of influence. So that's what I do. Thank you. Um, I think maybe we have time for one more question, and then we'll, yeah. Um, you talked about love as a collaborative work of art. I'm wondering, how do you balance your collaboration with someone you love, or how do you balance your commitment to yourself, your own hustle and grind, and your commitment to you and your partner, and that shared collaboration? And then your work with your partner, commitment to themselves, Everybody hear that? 
Yeah? Okay, I, for me, it's very clear. I do my wholeness practice because I have to do it. Because our sense, my senses will always take me away from myself, but going back has to be deliberate. Right? Because there's nothing inside that's going like this that attracts my, my awareness to it. It's quiet there. The only thing that calls me is actually what I call heartache. Right? Do you know what heartache is? You know when somebody dumps you and then you feel blue and you feel it here? Or your grandmother dies and you're really close to her and then you feel sorrow but you feel it here? What that all is is not about what's going on in the outside. That's your heart when a distraction dries up. Your heart calling you to come back home to your life. Because you lost that connection a long time ago in getting to know the world. It's always calling you back. That's the only thing that I know that makes, reminds me of the deliberate practice that I need to do to bring my awareness back. So I will take that time for myself, come hell or high water. And if somebody wanted to be with me, but that was, they, wasn't, they didn't have space for that, I would be by myself. <laughs> It's very, it's very clear. That's for me, that is more important than the relationship. Okay? Because it affects the relationship. Because it makes the relationship, relationship workable. For her to have some, you know, she has to do whatever she has to do. That's not my business what she does with herself in her time. But it has to bring her to something where she feels good being alive with or without me. Right? And then everything becomes easy. Then everything becomes easy. So, got to be respect both ways, right? Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's funny you ended with respect because that that for me is the biggest word in collaboration. Is there has to be mutual respect, and I think that in order to get that mutual respect in a collaboration with a loved one or or even just with with a close friend with with anyone it requires intimacy and, and, and the definition of intimacy or one definition of intimacy is the feeling that with a person you are able to be truly yourself, that you feel you could say anything to that person and they won't reject you, you know, um, that, that no matter what it is you say to them, that, that you feel completely safe with them. And I think that that is just such a necessary facet to, to Effective collaboration is a sense of intimacy, and I, and I don't think that intimacy uh, necessarily is something you can only share with people you know really well. I think that, that spontaneous intimacy can arise, um, because not every collaboration is with someone that you have a long storied history with, but I think without sort of establishing this base level of we see each other, we respect each other, we are safe with each other, that it, it becomes, it becomes again, that thing where that flow state can be shared, the flow state that can flow through two or more people in a collaborative project is what makes good work. It's what makes, makes things so um, incredible. And, and certainly the opposite of that, when you don't have intimacy, when you feel like the other person might come for you or take a shot at you or try to hurt you, um, that hurts the work, and very often that's when you end up with these projects that, that maybe don't see their final stages, that they maybe they crumble underneath their own weight. It's when there's not this ability for the collaborators to feel loving awareness towards each other, which can generate that flow state, which can see the project through to its completion and emergence. Yeah, I really like the conversation on intimacy. Um, particularly in my relationship, we like to use the intimacy and say, into me see. Um, and so when we are working on projects, both of us are crazy busy, but if, we're, if we do have that intimacy with each other and we're giving each other enough kind of like, okay, presence is like the biggest thing that you can have in a relationship, right? It's not about chocolates and diamonds and whatever. It's like, if, like pure total presence and sitting with each other. That's, and that might be... 30 minutes some days, you know? And, but I think it's just like seeing your partner, realizing that, okay, we can do this together, but I'm gonna sit here with you and let's be present. So uh, that concludes our first panel of the day. Can we please give an amazing round of applause for these incredible panelists?